Good morning, everyone. It's um, February 14th, Valentine's Day. Yeah. And Irene, one of us wore red. You look I got a little red. Oh, yeah, you look red. All right, you got a little red. All right, everybody's. I didn't do well at all. No. Never even thought of it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I thought of Valentine's Day, but I didn't when I was dressing, I guess. Um, but anyways, um, it's great to see you all and hope you had a good weekend. Um, we have uh, Ryan Patch with us again this morning, he was in last week, and um, he uh, is a participant uh, on the uh, Climate Council. And uh, so, uh, and we talked about how ag was, could play a role in all of that and thought we should have uh, Ryan back in to uh, to continue that that discussion and uh, and see what uh, they're proposing to do for ag for uh, keeping uh, carbon out of the air. So welcome, uh, Ryan, and I think you know everyone, so we can uh, fire right up. And, let you get started. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Chair Starr. Uh, for the record, Ryan Patch with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be back uh, with you, kicking off the week. Uh, last uh, I was here, big setup about agriculture and the opportunity that agricultural soils can play in both building uh, mitigation uh, you know, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, putting it in the, in the soil, as well as the role ag soils can play in building resilience, both for growing food and crops and, and for the watershed. Uh, I am going to uh, <laughs> uh, take some time to walk through uh, agriculture and how it is conceptualized within the Global Warming Solutions Act as it relates to the emission reduction requirements that are promulgated in the law, as well as the net zero targets that are also laid out, uh, and attempt to do a, a bit of history and a comparison about a uh, similar environmental management effort that was undertaken uh, and how the two processes uh, for the climate side still has some work to be done uh, as far as the uh, assessment and tracking of the progress agriculture is making towards either meeting the emission reduction requirements or towards the net zero uh, goals. And so some, some keywords here uh, I like to keep in mind, emissions reduction. The emissions inventory tracks the gross emissions of XYZ, uh, transportation fuels, heating, uh, cows burping, et cetera. We'll get into the real details of that. Um, so that's the emission side. Uh, the mitigation and net zero side focuses more on net accounting and the net balance, both that it is emitted and then what is sequestered, uh, it, you know, both, both through uh, both the reduction of emissions as well as the uh, sinks and ability for the soils and, and biomass to absorb additional carbon. So we'll be digging into uh, those uh, points of the uh, bill. And I will now attempt to share my screen. Apologies for being live stream. Got it. Share screen. Right. Screen. All right. Okay, so picking up in the middle of the uh, PowerPoint, I uh, am, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, right, the international body that gives direction for how uh, national inventories are to be conducted, the opportunities that exist uh, for uh, you know, uh, mitigation opportunities, uh, one of the chapters is focused explicitly on this term I'm going to introduce. It's a not my favorite acronym. I do like acronyms, but this one doesn't quite flow for me. Uh, so apologies in advance. But uh, in the uh, climate change assessment world, 
the new sectoral term that agriculture fits into, uh, this is from 2006, is the agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector. Now, people ask Ryan, what in the world is other land use? Uh, here, it's, it, within this sector, it's meant to mean uh, human-managed land, uh, whether it's grasslands, uh, you know, wetlands, uh, urban trees and, and green spaces, all the other areas that aren't developed and built infrastructure. <clears throat> and, and I'm going to belabor this huge block of text on the uh, screen, and I apologize for <laughs> maybe reading a bit too much, but I think it's really important to contextualize, try to bridge the gap between what I attempted to share last week, which is uh, the opportunity and how farmers are already doing good, and, and how we can track and support and encourage farmers to do more. And so the IPCC says that the agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector encompasses managed ecosystems and offers significant mitigation opportunities while delivering food, wood, and other renewable resources, as well as biodiversity conservation, provided the sector adapts to climate change. Right, it's interactive, it's not static. Uh, agriculture is gonna have to adapt to a changing climate, um, the, this, this, uh, the, this section of, this is the executive summary of the AFOLU sector in the recent release 2022 assessment report, the sixth assessment report that was put out by the IPCC. Land-based mitigation measures represent some of the most important options currently available. They can deliver carbon dioxide removal, CDRs, and substitute for fossil fuels, thereby enabling emissions reductions in other sectors. The rapid deployment of AFOLU measures is essential in all pathways, staying within the limits of the remaining budget for the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. Uh, where carefully and appropriately implemented, AFOLU mitigation measures are uniquely positioned to deliver substantial co-benefits to help address many of the wider challenges associated with land management. Uh, if AFOLU measures are deployed badly, then when taken together with the increasing need to produce sufficient food, feed, fuel, and wood, they may exacerbate trade-offs with the conservation of habitats, adaptation, biodiversity, and other services. At the same time, the capacity to support these functions may be threatened by climate change itself. So very interactive, uh, a huge portion of the, the world's surface is in the AFOLU sector, is privately owned or human managed. Uh, there's a lot of threats to agriculture and the AFLU sector, but also opportunities. Uh, and so at the core of this um, next part of our talk is an attempt to connect uh, the benefits of sequestration with the emissions inventory requirements that are uh, promulgated uh, in the Global Warming Solutions Act. So I apologize uh, for, once again, trying to compare this to the state's water quality cleanup efforts, but I think... It's all hand in hand, isn't it? Yeah, as we discussed, the co-benefits for water has many uh, climate co-benefits. What I'm gonna be digging into here for the next couple slides is a comparison of how, right, uh, the 41% of all phosphorus loading is attributed to agriculture. How was that measured and modeled? And how does that set up the reduction targets for agriculture and other sectors? And then comparing that to the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and the emission reduction requirements that are established in the Global Warming Solutions Act to try to compare how those uh, processes were uh, assessed. And it points to a gap yet unfinished, but work is ongoing on the ag side for uh, the GWSA inventory and implementation. So on the left-hand side of your screen, this is 20 years of track, right? How do we know we have phosphorus problems in the water? We have algae blooms, and we also track in the lake the amount of phosphorus that comes in. So we know at the mouth of all of these lake segments, you can see the trend lines here. Whoop, they're all going up, and they're all above the water quality standard. Now, uh, and when you <coughs> started uh, developing this phosphorus issue in the water. Did, how far back in time did the council go or have you gone to determine where that phosphorus came from in the beginning? And, or has it just always been here? Great question. Um, the TMDL for phosphorus relation in Plain Basin is based on long-term monitoring since the 1990s. 
however, there are considerations for in lake phosphorus in certain bays, St. Albans and Missisquoi, acknowledging that there is a legacy phosphorus load that was delivered long before any of the current generation was alive. So the, the transformation of the Vermont landscape, the harvesting of, of trees for developing potash, as well as uh, wide scale sheep farming, a lot of erosion, a lot of uh, historic phosphorus is in the base of all of these water bodies. So that's there in a consideration, uh, but the focus of the TMDL was the current uh, loading that's happening going into the lake. But no, uh, no research back in the 50s, um, 1950s, uh, late 40s, maybe uh, early 50s when uh, U.S. government was sending uh, superphosphate by the train car loads to all points in the Northeast to get more phosphorus into the soil. Did, do you go back to that point at all? Or? That's not likely accounted for in the long-term monitoring that's been ongoing, but you're, the, the point I take from that is uh, government intervention can affect uh, individual uh, managers of land, right? You give a lot of phosphorus, uh, they're going to use it. Uh, if you support cover crop, people will use it, right? So it's a, you know, what, 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 what public investments are made to support uh, environmental goals. Um, the the uh, point here uh, for the greenhouse gas emissions is that they're going up and they're measured at a global scale. All right, we know the concentrations are going up, and this is from the IPCC on the right, uh, looking at the relative contribution of the different areas. So just like we know phosphorus levels rising in the lake, globally we know CO2 levels and emissions are increasing. Uh, this is apportioned into loading uh, based on models. Uh, we know from the Lake Champlain Basin for the, the, the TMDL for phosphorus for Lake Champlain Basin based on uh, a, a lot of uh, land use imagery, but it gives us the, the, the base loading, right? We know agriculture from the current greenhouse gas emission inventory is 16% of Vermont's total emissions, just like it was 41% of phosphorus. Uh, the EPA set out reduction targets for water and I've highlighted the agricultural reductions for each lake segment. Uh, and on the right, we have the emissions reductions that were established by uh, the, the General Assembly uh, in the Global Warming Solutions Act. And so <coughs> comparing how the, all right, we know that levels are going up, phosphorus and CO2, where does that loading come from? For the Lake Champlain basis TMDL for phosphorus, we have this very, geospatially explicit uh, land cover data set and, uh, and assumptions that are uh, used based on uh, you know, the ag census and forest cover index and a whole bunch of other considerations to come up with relative shares of the land base, how much agriculture is using of land in the watershed, what managements are being applied, uh, a, a, a load that's delivered at the edge of the field and a load that's delivered to the water in an effort to really come up with a rather granular and process-based model which can give us a, a pretty specific degree of understanding about where phosphorus loading is coming from in the watersheds. Um, with the, and we'll get into more details with the uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, the state utilizes the EPA state inventory tool, which is a downscale national inventory. Um, it's much more coarse. It's not process based. It's mainly based on, uh, you know, the number of cows, as an example, the amount of milk produced in the state, the amount of alfalfa grown, the amount of fertilizer purchased and used by agriculture. Right? Those are the inputs that go into a spreadsheet-based model, which output relative shares of uh, methane and nitrous oxide emissions um, in that. What are the dark red areas in that map on the left? Developed lands. Ah, uh, so I assume the biggest one is Burlington. You got it. Okay. Yeah, and you see the uh, Plattsburgh. 89 corridor down to Montpelier Berry uh, yeah. area, yeah, across the river. So this is the, the whole the whole basin, yeah. uh, not just Vermont, of course. 
Um, and then uh, kind of the accounting, right? The reasonable assurance, assurances. How do we, the EPA uh, took the, the total load, apportioned it up into the watershed, ran uh, scenarios about can agriculture meet these reduction targets and how are they going to do it? Uh, in most cases, right, the RAPs are generally uh, assumed to, or modeled to meet the reductions. There are some special watersheds where they're not, and so farms are gonna have to do more. Uh, but that was all modeled and accepted before the TMDL was signed and approved. No such real accounting about these emission reduction targets and how is agriculture gonna get there uh, on my research was conducted prior to the passage of the Global Warming Solutions Act. And so this question of how are emissions tabulated, how is agriculture going to get there, how are we going to track it, is a lot of the work that the Climate Council and the Agriculture and Ecosystem Subcommittee specifically dug into trying to understand what are the most effective and cost-effective strategies for agriculture, uh, can they be counted in the emissions inventory, uh, and if not, why not, and can we count them? And so that's basically the narrative of the next part of this talk is trying to get into some of the specifics, starting from the, the big headline, um, right? There used to be greenhouse gas reduction goals. The Global Warming Solutions Act made them requirements. And it established uh, a few different uh, timelines, 26% reduction from the 2005 standard uh, by 2025. 40% from the 1990 standard by 2030, and 80% from the 1990 uh, standard by 2050. So some very uh, aggressive, but uh, the first two, the 26 and the 40 are in line with uh, some other states and, and commitments that are made um, uh, nationally. Uh, so goals to requirements. This, this slide's a mess. <laughs> um, two, two things to, uh, you know, wh where did this greenhouse gas goals come from, right? This, it was on the books. GWSA took that, made it requirements. Uh, you have to meet these requirements, uh, or there's a cause of action against <clears throat> A&R for the state's failure to meet those emission reduction requirements. Um, it was passed, Act, what well, best I can find, Act 168 of 2006, it was passed in 5-5 of 2006, um, establish those greenhouse gas reduction goals. A very important, uh, and we'll, we'll conclude with this thing highlighted in green, which is to say less than a month after that law was passed, the IPCC put out new standards and guides for how agriculture emissions are to be inventory for a national inventory. And so previously, um, and, and we'll get into this, ag emissions, and then the land on which those emissions are farmed are counted separately in the pre-July 2006 paradigm. It was then put together in 2006, and it remains so even in the latest AR6 uh, that was just published in 2022. I've also just, you know, there were amendments that were made uh, in Act 209 of 2008, and then the GWSA uh, was passed in, in 2020. And of course, there's been a whole bunch of developments, the, the Paris Accord and, and further greenhouse gas emission inventory refinements, the state of Vermont joining the US Climate Alliance, uh, and a lot of drivers leading us to the GWSA. Um, so in the GWSA, and, and this remains unchanged, uh, right? those emission reduction targets as measured in inventory pursuant to Section 582 of this title. So Title 10, uh, uh, Conservation Development, generally ANR's title, uh, has Section 582, the greenhouse gas inventories in it, uh, back in 2006 directed, and, and it remains relatively unchanged, uh, but directs them to conduct an emissions inventory. Um, and for, since 2000, since they started conducting the inventory, the state of Vermont has used the Environmental Protection Agency's state inventory tool. Uh, and it's an interactive spreadsheet model uh, that takes uh, the national inventory and downscales it to a state-by-state -state basis, and you're able to input state-specific data. Uh, in the case of agriculture, number of cows, uh, milk production, you can adjust for the number that are in, on pasture, the number that are uh, you know, in barns. So you can, you can adjust a whole bunch of uh, specific parameters within um, the spreadsheet. But at the end of the day, uh, it, it, is, it is still um, just a spreadsheet and it is a gross inventory, meaning it's just looking at the emissions from uh, the different sectors. <laughs> 
Um, we're back to maybe where I should have started. This is the picture of the latest greenhouse gas em uh, emission inventory that's put out by uh, ANR, and agriculture is tagged with 16% of the contribution. To put out there um, just this data point, uh, I'll, re I'll return to it uh, towards the end. This is from um, Dr. Ali Kasiba. She was at FPR. She's now at UVM Extension. Uh, this is looking at those emissions inventory. So if you take the, the, the sum of the emissions that are counted in the inventory from this pie and you put them on this graph, this chart, you see the estimated total emissions are here. Uh, when you include the net sequestration by forest and municipal, municipal trees, include emissions from land use change, and then from the burning of the harvest or the use of the harvested wood products, right, there is a, a, a net reduction in emissions, right? The, the forest sector took in, took in, the forest that we have in Vermont, the 73% of the land base, took in about 42% of the state's annual emissions. And is that increased each year with the growing, you know, trees will grow constantly. And I know we've had uh, uh, forests and parks and tell us how much a tree will grow a year. So our, our forests that, is their growth uh, included each year? Because it's all we hear about is we're losing our forests. Everybody's cutting all the trees. But I never, you never hear anybody say, well, our forests grew by 5% last year in normal growth. Uh, and to, you know, to offset uh, some of the harvesting. The um, Vermont Climate Council published a carbon budget which is a attempt to get at this kind of net analysis of when we look at our emissions and then we look at the opportunities for sinks, how are we doing and how do they change over time? Uh, the carbon budget was run uh, once and can be run again. I'm not the subject matter expert to speak to. Uh, I can say the importance of ensuring that uh, our carbon stocks remain carbon stocks is, is important, whether it's agriculture or forestry. I do know in the East Valley Appraisal Program, um, enrollment of uh, forest land seems to be up, but as far as the total land cover, I, I don't, that's not my area of expertise. So I, I don't know what the, I hear that we are losing uh, acres of forest land. The maturation of trees versus the loss, I, I don't know what the net balance is within the forest sector. So I, I got to apologize and, and, and say I don't, yeah. I don't, I, I can't answer that question other than to say, Right, we have a substantial carbon sink resource in Vermont that, based on this 2018 snapshot, would take in about 42% of all of those emissions. And so I think, you know, as we get into looking at the emissions that are tabulated within the greenhouse gas emission inventory, within the state inventory tool, right, this is consistent with that pre-2006 framework. Uh, we have uh, emissions tabulated on a gross basis, which includes those from agriculture with our methane and nitrous oxide emissions from cows, the storage of manure, the spreading of manure and the use of fertilizers that are also tabulated next to uh, sectors that are more transportation and fuel uh, use based. Um, that, that, that is the, obviously the, the largest <coughs> share of transportation uh, heating is in another important sector as well as um, electricity uh, use. But the point being, um, as we as we talked about uh, last week, the opportunity in the agriculture sector, including AFOLU, is not just emissions reduction. When we talk about emissions reduction, we, when we think about the transportation sector, we think about electrification, right? We think about uh, taking an internal combustion engine and, and making it electric, right? That negates those emissions from the, the burning of that fuel. What do we do in the agricultural sector? And I'll, I'll get to the, the point of this, which is what we're counting, what is being counted in the SIT tool, uh, right? But the, just to put up on the screen here, this is from the IPCC, agriculture can prevent emissions, it can reduce emissions, 
it can sequester carbon, and you can use products to substitute for more fo fossil fuel intensive um, products. Right, so there's a lot of opportunities in the ag sector beyond just looking at um, the emissions and how to reduce them. So, okay, digging into that 16%, uh, I appreciate you bearing uh, with me. The, as I said, the pre-2006 um, framework is still used in the EPA uh, SIP tool, and it's looking at uh, emissions from agriculture. What's included in this are is enteric fermentation, manure management, which means the storage of manure, and then the nitrous oxide emissions from soils, which includes some alfalfa, but is predominantly the spreading of manure on fields. So it's our ruminant animals, mainly our cows, and how are we managing their manure? What's not included in this inventory, because it's a, it's a gross inventory, is we're not looking at the soil carbon exchange. The opportunity for soils that take in more carbon than is emitted uh, on an annual basis. Is that because that hasn't been updated since 06? Uh, that's the punchline. <laughs> um, the EPA, I have, I have a slide on it, the EPA uh, acknowledges that this was updated in 2006, that it went from being uh, agricultural emissions and the land use, land use change in forestry, another terrible acronym, uh, acknowledges that they're put together. Uh, the EPA SIT, SIT tool uh, still has those uh, uh, sectors uh, inventory separately. They are reported together on a national scale, but how Vermont has applied it is looking at these four categories of emissions from agriculture. When we say the emissions from agriculture is 16%, we're looking at these four categories, and we're not looking at the management of these categories. That's what will be established later. It's not, it, right, it is a cow emits this amount, spreading this much manure stored in this way. It is a, 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 a workbook that looks up the number of cows, the amount of milk produced, and then spits out the emissions. And so management, right, when we talk about managing for soil health or managing for efficient uh, ruminant digestion, right, there are, there are ways to affect emissions from uh, manure uh, spreading <laughs> and storage, uh, but this is what's being looked at uh, within the manure, the, the manure and the milk issue. Um, I think we've been told in the past that why they use those two items is because of the the uh, commercial feed that we purchase from wherever that comes in here comes with phosphorus in those ingredients. And of course, the more milk a cow gives, the more feed you have to give them. And also, the more structural built the cow is, uh, the more manure and feed you give them, the more manure they're gonna produce. And, but what we've been told in the last few years is that feed companies have cut down tremendously on the amount of phosphorus that's going into the commercial feed. And my only question is, is that accurate? And are we checking feed, commercial feed today for phosphorus content to reduce the input into the animal? Do you, have you guys at a, Council talked about any of that? Um, we, so the input of cow numbers and milk produce is a good metric, right? You have high producing cows, uh, you're gonna have a lot of milk, you're gonna have a lot more manure, right? So that tracks, that makes sense. Um, on the phosphorus side, right, how does feed affect emissions? That is an ongoing area of research. There's certain uh, technologies or feed additives that are being studied that can affect ruminant digestion and the amount of methane that comes out. Uh, when it comes to phosphorus, uh, yes, that's definitely been a area of study and talking point for a while. Um, when it comes to whole farm nutrient mass balance, yes, phosphorus inputs and exports in the milk and the meat, the imports and the grain, all important to consider. When it comes to a nutrient management plan, 
whether it's a high phosphorus feed or a low phosphorus feed, that's going to be represented in the manure test, and manure is going to be applied uh, and managed based on that test. And so regardless if it's high or low, it'll be seen and reflected in the volume of the manure stored and the manure test. And so it is captured. If they have a lower phosphorus feed, they probably have more capacity, uh, you know, it, because you'll, if you have a lower phosphorus concentration manure, you can uh, apply more in, in an end-based um, limited system. Um, so the, the question about feed management absolutely did come up in the Agriculture Ecosystem Subcommittee. It is a recommendation. Uh, it is an area that Vermont is looking to do more research, uh, but is in the real beginning stages of trialing feed management for climate benefit in the state. So that, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a recommendation and something that needs um, some more research and, and support. But if, if you develop rules and regulations based on insufficient evidence, because you just said that it needs more study, um, but if we're developing rules and regs to, to move forward off faulty data, how are we, how are we supposed to get that right? One um, saying I've heard that makes sense to me in this case and applies specifically to climate action, climate mitigation, is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We know directionally that these soil health practices are good for water, good for climate. Exactly, we know how much we have accepted phosphorus reduction efficiencies from EPA and DEC, so we know how much the reductions are for phosphorus. We'll work out what the benefit is for climate on the back end. Let's just keep doing these practices. Um, we don't want to recommend uh, practices that may have uh, unintended consequence. And so being cautious about more, recommend, more research in the feed management space is where we are at. Um, that being said, uh, the recommendations for other climate action on ag is definitely let's move forward. When we get the accounting framework set up, we'll count all those benefits, but let's not pause to make a recommendation. We know um, cover crop, as an example, is good for uh, a whole host of things. So let's just do it. Irene. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, did I hear you say the data is from 2006? And if so, how many more years are we going to wait before this gets to the end? Sorry. Um, the, the charge for Vermont to start tracking emissions was 2006. Um, since Whenever the first one was published, I don't know. Uh, my understanding is this ANR has been using the state inventory tool from EPA, which is an appropriate state level assessment. The data, the most recent data is from 2017 for agriculture because it's based off of the ag census. And so this 2022 census last year will be published in 23. And so those num figures will be used moving forward for animal numbers and, and other inputs like that. Thank you. Uh, so this is how uh, emissions have changed over time uh, for uh, agriculture. Nothing too drastic, definitely some, some changes. Um, main mitigation options. Okay, so if we're just looking at, um, you know, ignore this on the right because uh, we, those aren't tracked in the emissions inventory. We're just looking at the enteric fermentation and the manure storage, right? Some example mitigation strategies, dietary adjustments, improved genetics, improved reproductive performance, right? If you can get more milk per cow for the same emissions, uh, that's a more efficient production of calories of food. Uh, within the manure storage uh, space, you know, different storages have different emission factors. Uh, what, we, what can happen is uh, and, and as you see here on, on the photo on the bottom, uh, digesters, right? You can cover and collect biogas, and you can either flare it, just converting the methane to CO2. And since the methane is such a high global warming potential, by destroying the methane and turning it to CO2, that is counted as emission reduction in methane. And that is currently the emissions reductions that uh, agriculture has in the emissions inventory. The 14 digesters in Vermont are tracked and counted, and the storage of that manure uh, is, uh, you know, doesn't have an emission because it's all captured and burned. Um, the 
opportunity here is, of course, the ability to take that biogas and turn it into a useful product, whether it's electricity, uh, using that, that uh, methane to, to uh, biogas to run a digester, whether it's flaring the methane and using it as a thermal application to heat the farm, to heat the milk house, to heat neighbors, uh, or uh, to take it, refine it, and turn it into renewable natural gas. And so there is a project in Vermont down in Salisbury that is providing Middlebury College with natural gas that has come from a dairy farm where the gases from the manure uh, and other uh, food waste has been uh, off gas collected and refined and put into the pipeline as natural gas. So you can get energy uh, from the manure. Uh, which is a, a valuable thing. It's very uh, expensive to implement, expensive to operate, and so we're looking at what are the best opportunities for our medium and small scale uh, farms in Vermont, because at this time, no off-the-shelf technology for Vermont-sized farms really exists in the way uh, the almost exclusively large farms are, are using uh, digesters uh, in the state. So we only have 14? Uh, based on my last check of the Agstar database, yes, 14. Um, okay, uh, what's, the, what's the point uh, of, of all this? Right? Mission inventory, we're, we're looking at manure storage and collection. We, because we know that not all farming is, has an equal environmental benefit. Right? On the left-hand side, we have what can be conceptualized as full-width tillage, uh, no conservation practices applied on a very steep slope, right? So lots of erosion, a lot of deposition, uh, a lot of uh, burning off of carbon in the soils in the form of organic matter. On the right-hand side, we have more of the type of farming system that relies on soil health practices and, and what Vermont farmers are, are moving towards. And what we see here is when you apply these managements, <coughs> Uh, not only do we have a phosphorus reduction efficiency that is um, accepted and applied yeah. by DEC for farms that implement an acre of cover crop, an acre of reduced or no-till, uh, another acre of riparian buffers or crop rotation, right? we can count that phosphorus efficiency. Uh, we don't yet have a state uh, efficiency for what happens in the crop. The picture on the left almost looks like it was hand-painted or something doesn't look like a real picture. Uh, do, do you know where that was taken from? I think it's Indiana. Oh, it's from some NRCS. Uh, I normally put the sources. I apologize. I, I, I've lost that in, in the years of using that image. Um, but it's it's a, just a, a low quality photo, <laughs> I think. Uh, it certainly doesn't look like a Vermont photo. No, no. I, I purposely chose a non-Vermont uh, park oh, for the left hand side. Uh, right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we really have farms that don't have a nutrient management plan? We uh, don't have any. There is a requirement for nutrient management for all farms in the state. Thank you. CSFOs and up need to have a written nutrient management plan. SFOs need to take soil tests and apply based on agronomic recommendations. If based on inspection they don't have that, there's an enforcement mechanism to compel them to. And what's the fourth uh, management practice? It's kind of blacked out oh, there. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's a crop rotation. OK, thanks. And uh, I wouldn't use Indiana pictures because if you went to a public meeting and you showed this, I mean, I'd even be upset that a farmer in Vermont would let their fields yeah. look like that. and and. You know, I visit farms quite often, and I haven't seen anything like that in Long time. 20 Well, the loss of soil is so years. But anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe a black and white photo from 50 years ago <laughs> okay. that's in Vermont would be humble, but, you know, to show, like, over time it's changed. But, but yeah, I think that <laughs> the credibility there just doesn't do it for me. Just, just try to, the, so the point of this is not Vermont farmers, <laughs> I know. Uh, you know, are universally, uh, I think this is a target on the right. The point is, and, and it's meant to be uh, stark, right? It's not the same, right? It's not one for one. Managing a cow this way does not have these outputs. Managing growing an acre of corn on the left is not the same environmental impact as growing an acre of corn on the right. Um, and the, um, 
So the other uh, component of this, I don't know, representation is that there are also emission reduction coefficients, ERCs, that can be associated with these particular managements. And the state is not yet there yet for uh, accepting or publishing a, a, what, what emission reduction coefficient is. So, so this big chart is just intended to show that from the same unit of land, when you apply uh, a, a conservation practice, for example, cover crop, right? There's not only an increase in soil carbon, right? Total CO2 across all of the categories, 0.16 CO2 equivalents an acre a year. However, there's also uh, nitrous oxide emissions from the soil surface, depending on the management. So this actually shows an increase in emissions of direct uh, nitrous oxide from the application of a cover crop, but the total net emission reduction coefficient is 0.15, with a range of a net emission to a net sequestration. And that's the whole point of this. Uh, you can dig into all the specifics, but managing land is not created equal. Applying a conservation practice can have a net sequestration, uh, and depending on it, it can have a net emission. It's not always the right application depending on the, the pre-existing pre conditions, uh, but the, the point is, it's not zero. It's not uh, one to one. There, you, management can affect outcomes. Well, that I I believe in. I mean, we we done set up these practices to help farmers uh, do the practices for this sole purpose. Uh, and are there certain crops that that make a bigger difference because we could you know we could pay more if you plant a than if you plant b and and you know farmers are very good about adapting to different uh, suggestions but you know somebody's got to help them understand that and is that you or I so with the direction of the legislature, 6 PSHF 215 gives the agency that authority to run conservation programs. Right, we partner with NRCS to uh, pay for conservation implementation, farm agronomic practices programs, right, cover crop, crop rotation, water buffers, uh, increased grazing management. Those are all predicated on water quality, but there is a climate benefit, and so articulating and tracking that climate benefit is, I think, the point of this whole two hours of trying to share this all with you is that we can do both with the programs that exist, uh, and you made an investment in those programs with the 4.76 million in additional ARPA dollars that are going towards this over the next four years. And so that's a big infusion uh, to support farmers to do more, and it pairs well with the Payment for Ecosystem Services group that spent three years recommending that program, which is going to further do an assessment looking and kind of matches up with this slide, not just at the cropland, but looking at the land uh, adjacent to the cropland. So the buffers, the unmanaged land, they can enroll forest land. Uh, but the, the other point of this is, you know, the ag portion of the land use sector, farmers aren't just crop farmers in Vermont. They may do maple sugaring, they may have a woodlot, uh, and so uh, accounting for that is an, another thing to consider, right? If you have an acre, this is from the 2017 Ag Census. As soon as I have the 2022 Ag Census, I will be updating this to see what's changed over the past five years. Uh, but 47% of the land farmers manages woodland, 47% of the land farmers manages harvested cropland and permanent pasture. And so that's where my talking point one to one. If you so support farmers to have an acre of cropland, they're also stewarding an acre of forest land over here. And so the, the compounding benefit of keeping land in agriculture, you know, you're going to get the, the additional carbon benefit from the trees on the crop. When when you go to uh, you know East Coast uh, conventions or national conventions, and you talk, you know, hear talks about the same issue. How do we compare like with other states in in the country? Yes, so US Climate Alliance is a great place to learn from how other states are approaching oh. climate change. Yeah. 
Uh, Maine, for example, has two inventories that they've instituted. One is the gross emission inventory that, like Vermont does, and the other is a net emissions inventory. Um, you know, we think we're doing well with 73% forested. They're up in the 80s of, of forest cover that they have. And so their gross, you know, to account for that, they pass a lot of also count uh, the, the net emissions within the state. Uh, uh, you know, this is a big question, right? There's been a lot of, you know, you, you look at the, the you know, agriculture globally is 11% of emissions, right? It's not the largest driver of climate change and it provides important uh, food security and, and, and other outputs from the land base. So a lot of focus and research has been on, in my understanding, uh, you know, fossil fuel based sectors and how to have a transition to, uh, you know, carbon free economy, or right? it's still maintaining an economy while, while transitioning out of use of fossil fuels. And so the, the, the maturity of the, the, the state inventory, the national inventory assessments for this question of ag forestry and land use, uh, how, do, how, do, how does the state deal with agriculture is a question that I feel is not answered on the national stage. And so this is not, a, I feel, a reflection on Vermont or anything Vermont's been doing. It's just bringing up, hey, as you set this emission reduction target, Maybe there's this piece that's missed there about the whole sequestration potential that agriculture is separated from. This Vermont's not the only state to be wrestling with this, so we're not alone in, in looking at this uh, question. Uh, and at this time, there's no real solution. There's so no you final can't solution. Tell us if we're doing as good as Maine or New Hampshire and New York, uh, uh, or if we're if we're really down in the lower um, group of, you know, trying to get this done, and because we seem to spend an awful lot of money and time, or, I mean, we have in this committee to try to help all these things, and uh, are we are we doing as well as our neighbors? You might say. I. Uh, like the point of graphs and charts and other people's data to be like, look, what are we doing? Uh, all I have for that is, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's really been a comparison of the progress states have made towards these goals, but anecdotally speaking with colleagues in other departments of agriculture and, and other a uh, the system that Vermont has set up to deliver service to farms based largely on water Right, it's not just we have a regulatory backstop, we have our IPs, but then there's also education, outreach, technical financial assistance, and a lot of investment, a permanent funding source. A lot of states are jealous of Vermont and the system that we have set up. The, the permanent funding system uh, for water it is, is incredibly important for keeping this progress happening for agriculture. Last week, you'll remember I shared the 95% of phosphorus reduction coming from agriculture. Maintaining that funding is needed for you know, agriculture's uh, need to meet the TMBL, but we also get all these climate co benefits. And, and when I, you know, say statutory 6 VSA chapter 215, you know, there are components of that where, uh, you know, the state agency of ag is directed to work with NRCS, right? There's a lot of states where those agencies don't really get along for some reason. I don't know, I don't know how, um, <laughs> but, you know, I think that's some of the strength in Vermont is small state, yeah. uh, a lot of people working together, and a, a permanent funding source uh, that, is be, that is very effective for, uh, at, at this time. So I, I think Vermont's doing pretty well on, on that space. I, so I get in a broad sense, there are all overall areas where we can reduce and all. Sitting here, as I put money towards this, but and we talk about putting money, I really don't get a feel about where are the areas that we're spending money that we're getting the biggest bang for the buck for, and how would I sort that out? You know, I understand where the dairy cows are here, and I understand that within that whole realm, there's the whole levels, and then on the soils, there's the whole realm. But there's a number of different things you can do. If we did no-till cedars versus other things, what do we get and how do I know that I'm putting my money where I can get the biggest bang for the buck 
in, in, in doing this? How can I, as a policy person, sort through this? I, I think that's a, a great question, and I am going to attempt to share. Looking for your answer. <laughs> well, good. I, you know, because there's so much here that, you know, it's like, oh. Well, I mean, I don't know how many million we've spent. Well, I, I get that, and I, I'm just trying to say, how do I measure that I've done the best? But no, you have no till cedar. <clears throat> 200,000, you're going to have to seed by hand, one seed at a time. Yeah, but she's saying. No, but I, but, but I mean, when I look at the soils, I, I got the picture the other day from um, um, North, North Dakota when they're showing yeah. that um, it was pretty sad if you don't, it's pretty clear that that helps a lot. Yeah. But versus other things, how, where's my biggest bang? Sure. So this is from the Nature Conservancy Canada. And they, oops, sorry, did a study of just the national working land. So I can't compare this to, uh, there's a whole, IPCC has a, chart which can talk about the relative cost effectiveness of different strategies and, and agriculture comes out pretty well in that uh, matrix and I can share that with you as a, as a orientation point. I don't have that uh, with me either off the top of my head or, or in the presentation. What, what I do have is a comparison of the natural and working lands mitigation opportunities in Canada, right? So this is TNC Canada doing a, a nationwide analysis of the opportunity that exists by 2030. And they were surprised to find that agriculture uh, was, and cropland management was the largest single opportunity for, between protecting the existing land base, man management changes, and restoration, uh, but the largest potential sources for mitigation were, were agriculture. Uh, and they were available for relatively cheap. Right, uh, 19.6 metric tons in, in uh, or million metric tons in, in in Canada, available below $50 a, a ton. And so, it, it when you think about, so I what I get from yeah. you just said is it's cropland management that is for them nearly a third of everything. Yeah. And um, how can I translate? So is that where I should spend? A lot of mine, uh, or or we're spending a lot of our money, and so in relationship to that, I'm I'm just trying to. Yeah. So the you know I shared in our last um, discussion the point of or the the state of soil health, right? The the opportunity for ag soils to provide a big sink, uh, and. The, the point I'm, I'm bringing up is in the emissions inventory with the targets, oops, sorry, uh, it started me up where I left off. And, and can I ask, sorry to take up so much time, but in that, and what the Canadians did in that study, is that what it's produced to get from here to the end of it? Or does it take out that a field of corn apparently or a, a field of crops does eat up so much carbon itself in its growing. So is that a net number? Yes. Okay. Yep, and, and I think that's the whole point of this is the Ag Ecosystem Subcommittee looked through natural climate solutions, looked through agriculture management. They're cost effective, farmers are implementing them. They are very effective. They provide an immediate and medium term benefit under the emissions reduction framework that the GWSA is promulgated on, we can't count those towards agriculture's emissions because it's just the cows burping, the storage of the manure, and the spreading of manure that makes up, and a little bit of fertilizer use, that makes up that 16%. And so this is to a structural challenge that we're working with uh, a and R on, uh, which is to review the agricultural sector greenhouse gas emissions sequestration in Vermont. How to set up a framework which is inclusive of how to meet net zero targets, 
um, but also trying to wrestle with this seemingly intractable issue, which is emissions on a gross basis for agriculture, just look at cows and manure, and aren't inclusive of those cost-effective reductions. And so the recommendations from the Agri Agriculture Ecosystem Subcommittee uh, was, uh, I didn't share my screen, so I apologize, um, is focused on continuing to support uh, those practices which are delivering water quality success, like continuing to build on that. There's already a functioning system. Uh, literature shows they're, they're cost effective and effective, and eventually we'll figure out a way to count and track those for uh, climate. But that, that's the, uh, the, I guess, point of this next hour of the, of, the, of the presentation is there's a lot of power in ag soils. It's not fully able to be counted in the emissions inventory at this time. And so that's just one of the big gaps yeah. that the Ag Ecosystem Subcommittee wrestled with, recommended research. Uh, we've uh, state through ANR received funding from US Climate Alliance to engage in a contractor and do this research. And so there's no recommendation yet, and that's going to be forthcoming. Um, but I just wanted to make you, you all aware of some of the structural issues, I, I think, within the, 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 the contract of the law for agriculture that we can't count those yeah. benefits towards that. Like it's not like farmers do more cover crop and then that 16% goes down. It's not, it can't count that. And at when, this time. when is that going to be completed so we have those numbers available? The RFP was out, it's closed, it's being reviewed. I'm, I'm hopeful that the work will start this spring. And I believe the timeline is a recommendation in 2023. So a recommendation before uh, next uh, legislative session. Uh, what, what bothers me about the whole issue is we don't have the data to be able to load onto the vehicle that's moving through here this year, not next year, but this year. So how are we, you know, as a representative of the people back up in the <clears throat> Northeast Kingdom, how do I go home and sell them on the idea that we're doing, we're doing much right, but yet we haven't got the studies all done to, to get there. And, you know, they're going to tell me, you better back school body. You know, I mean, I, I don't know how you move forward with a plan without all the data that you need to put a good plan together with. It's it. You and I are saying the same things, probably from different places. I'm trying to say, what? where's the biggest bang for the buck? And you're saying, I haven't got the studies done to tell you. Well, they think they know that there's a lot missing from the soils that we're producing, and but we aren't sure. It might turn out to be a negative. Uh, I, I they're, they're, yeah, so to, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And, uh, you know, we know something is directionally beneficial. We just so. Do you, would you like calling these people? Um, if you have a note for them, you, yeah, you can give it to me. I can send it to them. I'd rather have you call them on the phone. Oh. Are you going to do that? Yeah. I don't know. I just made a message. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good day. So we, we, we know there's a lot of opportunity here. We know there's positive sequestration. Uh, if you run another module with an SIT, we know that there's positive sequestration on an annual basis from all the agricultural mm -hmm. lands. Uh, and implementing those practices are needed for water quality, right? And so the, the message to farmers is keep doing the water quality practices. There's benefits for climate. We know there are positive benefits. We can use this tool, the, the comment tool, to, to track the benefit. What's the right tool for Vermont, though, is 
the, the research question, like how specific can we get? Because we have very good data, right? We're tracking on an acre by acre basis, all of the implementation that's happening uh, on farms. Uh, DEC can use that geospatial data to apply a phosphorus reduction coefficient, and that's what gives us all of those ag reductions. Working on building that for climate is where we are. So it, I'm hoping that the message isn't, you know, ambiguity. It's keep do, keep using these good practices. This we'll be able to count them hopefully in the near future. So it's not to say hey, stop and throw it all away. It's like no, keep doing the water practices. We know we get these benefits, and um, this will be reconciled hopefully in the. Well, we've next been moment. at this since '06 or something, eight or something. I mean, 15, 18 years. And uh, why, why, with the reports that we've been getting in the ag room from you folks and farmers, and they they like what we're doing. They're doing what we ask them or suggest to do. Uh, the agencies are all working together, um, so why would you tip the cart on its side and do some other stuff if everything is moving in the right direction? Uh, the only thing we could do is speed it up a little bit and make it go faster, but so would you say we're doing pretty good? I, I would. I, you, the main recommendation from the Agri Ecosystem Subcommittee is, uh, I'll paraphrase, keep using the existing state programs. Yeah. They're working, they're functioning, farmers are participating, uh, and we'll count the benefit in, in, the, in the near future. But we know it's real and tangible. Uh, it's just finding the, the right model and the right assumptions to uh, make sure that we're assessing all of those practices on, a, on an equal basis. So. Yeah, and we know that the development of smaller digesters, you know, to use up even, get more of this gas out of the manure is, it's coming, but it isn't here yet. You know, it, it, it hasn't been developed fully. Yes, that is a, an area, you know, identifying the, the gaps, right? The feed management research and programs. A lot of people see opportunity there. You know, funding, funding that research is, is important. Finding small scale digesters and technologies and, and an implementation structure that works is important um, because farmers are busy farming and to drop a digester that you have to manage and a gen and a new motor to generate electricity, it's, it's, it's a lot to ask of a small farm that may not have additional staff. And so how do you find a technology that is beneficial and adds to either the revenue stream or viability of a farm while also getting that emission reduction benefit from the destruction of that methane and manure pit? Um, there is no silver bullet at this point in time for the medium and small scale farm, but we are working with you know, partners and others in state government to try to come up with a, a framework and some technologies that will be appropriate for Vermont farms. So there isn't anything from your professional point of view that you would recommend to us to do like during this biennium to, to help with your process other than keep doing what we're doing and Keep, try to keep that funded in, in my... Yeah, yes, yes, Senator, I, I think that is a, a fair summary, is processes are working. Uh, I, I think they're working well, uh, and no specific policy recommendations at this time on, on the climate, climate front outside of that minor housekeeping provision in the SEEP program, which kind of speaks to the term emissions reduction compared to mitigation, right? And trying to use that mitigation term from the Global Warming Solutions Act to be, be more inclusive of the sequestration as well as the emission reduction. And, and so that would be the, the only, um, I, I think, uh, tangible piece of policy the agency has proposed at this point um, is in that housekeeping bill. Yep. Any other questions? Brian? Not a question, just a comment, I guess, Mr. Chair. I I'd rather see money spent helping the small farmer buy a digester than do another study about how we're doing. Uh, 
it just, to me, it gets a little bit, I don't know what the right term is. We, we seem to study and study and study. And yet, from what you're saying, and I believe, I think your agency does a great job. I think you do a super job. All the things we've talked about, land management, feed management, all those things are working. I don't know what else we need to study. Just to count something as, it, it just, it, it mystifies me why we can't just say to the farmer, here's something we know will work, we're gonna pay for it. <laughs> I think we're there. Do the cover crop, do the no-till, do the grazing. We know those work. We know there's a benefit. Uh, setting up, you, you remember there was a bit of a lag time in the phosphorus world for, we know that these practices are beneficial. The amount, the exact degree based on soil type, based on, that's, what, that's what's so challenging to get down to a process-based model that isn't just acres of corn and numbers of cows, is it becomes very interactive and very complicated based on soil type, slope, management, you know, how, how can you get down to that level of detail uh, it, it is, is really where the, the, the nuts and bolts of the work is. Like directionally, we know these are good and have a positive sequestration benefit. Um, exactly how much, we know what the parameters are, but making that fit Vermont's landscape is where that, that research stands. So, you know, at this, you know, generally around $10 million uh, between, you know, in the clean water uh, fund uh, for agriculture, right? and about, you know, this is a $75,000 grant from the U.S. Climate Alliance. So it's not, it, it doesn't take a lot of resources to get there because a lot of work is done outside of Vermont. It's just pulling together the right combinations of models uh, and the existing statewide data that we have to, to really mesh it together in a, in a reporting framework that's going to do justice to the opportunity that's there. Okay. So next year you'll have that report that you can come back to us with? It is, I got, I got to check in with James Orchek on the timeline of that RFP. My memory is we're going to have a final report in 2023 with some recommendations for next steps out of that Climate Alliance grant. So uh, my my gut feeling is yes, by the next time this, this biennium, the, the next 24, right, is it? It's 23 right now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that will hopefully we'll have some, some recommendations. You are doing all the figuring on this stuff. <laughs> I don't know what year it is. What year it is. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I, don't, I don't blame you for losing no, track. We've been at this so long. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, if there are no other questions. You're doing a good job. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate uh, your attention. It's good to for us to hear that what we have done in the past to move uh, this stuff forward is is working to the best it can from your knowledge and and uh, you're the ag expert on this and so it's it's good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So. I got a little job for you, a message to deliver elsewhere in the building. <laughs> no, I'm sorry I had to get up twice. <laughs> it's a, I'm a page today, it's a part-time page. <laughs> he, just asked, he just asked the page to return some phone calls. Yeah. Maybe you'd be better at that. Yeah. <laughs> On her first day, right? Didn't they just start today? Yeah, they did. <laughs> She didn't know what to do. <laughs> Poor thing. Uh, <laughs> She'll never be back. She <laughs> oh. I wonder if it was Tom Shittenden's daughter. That was? It might have been. Yeah. Oh, very positive. Yeah, yeah, very, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's very Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. That last <laughs> group of pages we had was a good. They were funny. Yeah. 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 They were. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Good. Well, Michael, good morning. Good morning. Um, so can we uh, chat a little bit about our right to farm stuff? Sure. Is that what we're on? Yep. I think you're going to write up some some new stuff. Sure. And, and the only question that that I've had sent to me in regards to our suggested changes was uh, 
word reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That, so we, you must have figured out a different word that we can use there. <laughs> Not sure about that, but I'd like to talk about that. It's on page five. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, so Michael did some work on our right to farm. And did you work in that mediation type deal? I did. Oh, okay. So, uh, you want to run? Do you have copies or? Uh, I think you all have copies in front of you, from what I can see. Yeah, I'll read that. Yep. All right. Um, I can put it on the screen in a minute, but it, it's always right when I'm about to testify that an app has to update itself. Do you want me to do that? Pardon? Do you want me to use If you want to, it's taking longer to, to update or something. Here it is. Okay. So, you heard test this is Michael Grady with the State Council. You heard testimony over the past couple of weeks um, about how the current standard or the standard in the bill that you were looking at that would prevent a person from bringing a nuisance action was in part based on whether or not they were complying with agricultural water quality requirements. And, and you heard from a couple of different. Uh, interested parties that that might not be the best um, best standard and that it doesn't cover every type of activity that might generate a nuisance. And then you heard from the agency um, about pesticide and pesticide drift and about how if they're complying with the pesticide rules that there shouldn't be pesticide drift um, and that they're, uh, if they're complying with it, then they're basically um, shouldn't be creating a nuisance or a trespass. Um, but then that, that doesn't all, if you include ag water quality requirements and then compliance with the pesticide rules, that still doesn't get to all of the activities that potentially could cause a nuisance, say odor, flies, dust, et cetera. So the chair asked me to look at how some of the other states do that. And what the, the other states do is that they say that there is no nuisance action that can be brought. You have the time period, it's usually one to three years so that, that they've been there um, prior to the surrounding activity. And then the farm has to be complying with good agricultural practices. And generally, those states that use that standard, which include um, Connecticut, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Tennessee, and a few others, they define um, the generally accepted agricultural practices, and you'll see this on page four. So what I've done is I've, I've added a definition to the right to farm law. And it would define generally accepted agricultural practices as complying with your agricultural uh, water quality requirements in 6 BSA chapter 215, including any permit requirements or requirements of the RAPs, complying with the <coughs> Agency of Agriculture's Food and Markets Rule for Control of Pesticides. And then this last subdivision C is how many states define what a good agricultural practice is. It's practices conducted in a manner consistent with proper and accepted customs and standards as established and followed by similar operations of agricultural activities in a similar municipality or region of the state and under similar circumstances. Now, there's a, some variations on that and you could probably get some simpler language, but it's basically that you are conducting your agricultural practice in a way that others in that municipality or region <coughs> or state would be conducting those agricultural practices as well. The issue with this type of language is it becomes a, it becomes a fact-based issue. It's, it becomes something that a court has to figure out. Um, and so the court would have to look at and take testimony on what the, the custom and proper accepted practices are in that municipality and region, but it sets a baseline of what is acceptable and normal uh, for purposes of a nuisance or trespass. 
So what, what do you folks think about uh, setting something like this up? Uh, or at least, uh, I, I guess, if you haven't got suggestions on, on how to fix this, what we should do is, uh, we're, I think we have this back on the agenda uh, for Friday, I think. And um, we hopefully could get some witnesses in. Are you, are, Emma, are you going to have any witnesses available on Friday? To I am. I'm going to have a list for Monday by the end of the day today. Yep. So we could hear from, you know, the witnesses that maybe that we'd heard from before or even new people um, to uh, give us some direction on, on uh, language. Um, but there is an additional component. And, and uh, the chair stopped by my office one day and talked to me about testimony that you received. I think it was from Mr. Sanderson, I think his name was, at, at CLF, about how uh, he identified an issue with the bill as taking away redress or, or an opportunity for a remedy from neighboring property owners. And uh, that was an issue that arose in the Sport Shooting Range Protection Act. Um, like 2005, 2006, where there was a similar nuisance protection afforded to sports shooting ranges if they had been in operation for a certain amount of time, and they were complying with with range practices, etc., and complying with municipal ordinances, that they would be protected from nuisance protection. So what the General Assembly did then is said, you you're not necessarily prohibited from bringing a nuisance action property, neighboring property owner, but before you do, you have to at least attempt to go to mediation once in the sports shooting range. Yeah. And that is a that is not um, that is not unique to the sports shooting range protection act in Vermont. It is it is a, a a process that's used in at least three states under the right to farm law. And at least three states. Yeah, it's on page six. So we didn't yeah. we didn't figure that out on our own. No, it was oh. it was something that that was brought to the Senate Judiciary Committee when they were doing the Sports Shooting Range Protection Act and said, hey, but I think at that time they focused on Iowa. It said Iowa has this mandated you have to go to mediation before the nuisance suit can be brought. Iowa has it. Maryland has it. Louisiana has a different, Louisiana encourages people to go to mediation, but if they file without going to mediation, the court can require mediation before the court takes up the nuisance. We've already, Vermont already passed that with the shooting range. It's, it's already in, so in law for sports shooting help ranges. Down in judiciary, uh, if we get the bill out of here and goes there, uh, so we're using their language. It's very similar to the sports shooting range protection. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Michael, if it does go to mediation, would the court, well, let me back up. If it goes to mediation and is not resolved, and it then eventuates into a, a court hearing, would the testimony taken in the mediation help to determine the facts in the court? Um, you know, basically, I will need to check on this with the judiciary uh, team, but in, in certain mediations, you are allowed to use record testimony that's produced. Um, and so it, 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 it's possible. Okay. It, and okay. this is a um, mediation going to court, not well, mediation um, going to, in, do you appeal to ag? No, that's, that's a, actually a great question. Because that's how Maryland does it. Maryland has a mediation board built into their agency of agriculture, right. and so that was my and so you you apply for mediation to that board before you can bring a nuisance claim 
in Maryland. And this envisions going to a mediation in court? This is me. It's, it's, you can use a licensed mediator to do this. It doesn't actually yeah. have to go to court, but the results would then be recognized, if agreed to, would be recognized by a court as binding. So if, so, if, oh, sorry, go ahead. If uh, Scott was it? Mm -hmm. I mean, if he would go along with the way we've got this, Michael's crafted it, I think <clears throat> an individual homeowner that has a problem with a farmer, mm -hmm. I would think that they would would feel like uh, it would be fair if you went to a neutral mediation group or person. But if you had it over in the Department of Ag, they might feel that you're giving the farmer a leg up and, and, and not feel it's very free, you know, or, or even. Right. And to, to appease the, the opposition to this, um, if they go along with what we got, uh, I would, I would presume and feel better leaving it like we got it than setting up a, a separate uh, group in the ag agency to act as a mediator. Well, uh, Brian, how would it work if if one party just didn't want to mediate? How does that all get figured out and who pays for it and how the mediator is chosen? Well, the, the language here provides that if there's going to be mediations, the party shall share the cost. Okay. okay. Um, and if a party doesn't want to go to mediation, um, there's options. Right now, the language basically says that they can agree to go to binding arbitration. Um, and, and you still can, you have to, you have to basically, the language requires you to attempt to, to resolve this suit through mediation. It doesn't require, require it to be resolved. Mm -hmm. So you would just need to show I that see. you attempted mm -hmm. uh, and that the other party would not go to mediation, etc. And then you would be able to, to bring your thing. Right. I just, so I'm going to apply to a third party mediator. Where do I apply? No, you don't apply. You basically, the two parties agree to hire a mediator and to conduct mediation. Mediation results in an agreement. And then that agreement is formalized, can be formalized by a court. Okay. Well, there's, me, there's people that do this no. professionally um, around the state. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of teacher contracts, uh, some of them will get to a, a mediator. Um, court cases sometimes get to uh, a mediator, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, what other things? If you go to the Human Rights Commission, you appeal to the Human Rights Commission then a third party mediator is hired to right. sort out between them. But it's done under the umbrella. There's just a number of ways to do this. There are. And I'm just trying to understand. And I mean, think I, think it's, I think it's great to go to a mediator. Think of it like divorce, right? When you're doing a voluntary divorce. You go to court. You go, you, you have to follow the process in court for, for divorce, but you can also, through a voluntary agreement between the two parties, and that can include a mediation where you meet, you hire a mediator to resolve <coughs> things like compensation for a house or child custody, et cetera. Or the court can, um... Or the court can order that, that's true. And remember, this is a prerequisite before you go to file with the court for nuisance action. So the, the intent is that it's resolved okay. between the parties before it gets to the court, but it still can go to the court. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm 
sorry. No, that's okay. Good question. You know now when you go get a divorce, you know how to do it. <laughs> after 27 Just years, get your wallet out. And, after 27 years, you not it. be married, Bobby. You <laughs> know <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, what are you? Are, you, are we headed in any direction, uh, Irene? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with the current backup in the court systems, does that just mean that the blessing for mediation work waits a few years, or can that be done quickly? You know, a mediator comes to a conclusion, submits it to the court. Can they rubber stamp it soon after, or does that just mean the odor or the problem is going to go on for five years while they wait for the court system? Sure. Um, you know, this is something I'd probably want to check with the administrative uh, judge about. But I think likely what the courts would do is they would use an assistant judge to approve this um, because it is uh, an agreement between the parties. Um, so I think that that is what the courts would do. But I would check with the administrative judge um, first. But if, uh, if the uh, side judge or those could deal with something like this, it'd be a lot quicker Cheaper. Uh, cheaper, you get it resolved sooner. Yeah. Because most of these issues, uh, you know, the faster you can get it resolved, uh, the better the neighbors will get along afterwards. And, and, you know, we're getting down to the point where, you know, we're getting fewer and fewer farms all the time. And, and more and more neighbors all the time. And um, the quicker you could get something like this resolved, it would be better for yes. for everybody um, involved. Um, Just um, when the CLF guy came in and said, well, most people go and talk. When it's conflict with the neighbors, people avoid conflict. So I think a mediator idea like this is a great idea to help bring people together. Yeah, uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a question, Michael, on page four, um, subsection C. I'm reading it and I'm thinking to myself, are there really that different customs and standards throughout the state? Or I'm trying to understand why we, it seems to indicate that there probably are different accepted agricultural practices from county to county from geographic limitate all that kind of stuff i think i think that's a decision that you could make that it it is that you could limit it to similar practices within vermont uh, i don't think there's that much variation for between no. municipality and region in the state anymore um, especially with uh, farming practices becoming so efficient and based on a lot on the technology that's being used. Uh, I do think you could probably say it was within the state instead of this value region. But I was using another state as a standard, actually four other states. And they have that similar region or municipality language. I didn't want to, I wanted to bring you something that you could say, hey, this is how they do it. Yeah. Elsewhere. I'm just wondering, I mean, if yeah. I live in Rutland County, so are the practices in Rutland substantially different than they are in Essex or Orleans? Well, I County? think Addison might be different because they got all that heavy clay. So they may have some okay. different practices working that wet, heavy clay land than Okay. Then you might all run the Connecticut River, but we're still small enough, uh, right. so that uh, should be pretty much the same. Brian, so where did the required agricultural practices come into to this? I know they so, they so, are. Where's that part so of a, the definition? So in order to, you'll see on page five, in order to. Um, provide that no use and suit can be brought. It still is, has been in operation for more than one year and the activity was not a nuisance or trespass at the time the activity was initiated. Then we add the, uh, 
uh, we added something of the pesticide. pesticide. Yeah, page four. That's page four, line yeah. eight. We yeah. added that so that that's clear that if they aren't following those rules right. and regs, they're in trouble. Right. And then the activity has to be conducted in accordance with generally accepted agricultural practices. That means it has to comply with the RAPs and its other ag water quality, relevant ag water quality permits. It has to comply with the pesticide rules. And then it has to be in conformity um, with the practices conducted um, by similar operators of ag activities in whatever geographic state region. Of Vermont. Uh, so then why are we, and this is, I'm just probably being obtuse here, why are we saying generally accepted agricultural practices in some spots and not RAPs in others? Why don't we just do consistently, everybody, help me kind of. Well, the RAPs are very, are, they are water quality focused. Right. And as you heard from Laura DiPietro and Steve Collier, it, they don't, specifically address all forms of activity that can raise nuisance claims. Right. So pesticide application, for example, right. drift, that's not covered by the RAPs. Right. Odor would not be covered by the RAPs. It would be covered by the large form permit, but not the mm -hmm. RAPs. Thank you. Dust, etc., not covered by yeah. the RAPs. So that's where you get that third category of the generally practices that are consistent with similar. Is there something in statute that defines generally accepted agricultural practices or is that like a, this is what would a lawyer's it. dream? <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did reference that. I do think it will yeah. be something where people would have to prove through evidence, witnesses, probably bringing somebody from extension or the agency to say sounds that, sounds the, like, that yeah, the practice that's being brought is practice being addressed is something that's a generally accepted practice. Okay. Thank you. See that, uh, Irene? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does 2C in any way hinder innovation on the farm? Like someone's afraid to try something because nobody else is doing it, and yet it's... Interesting. It could reduce a lot of greenhouse gases or something, but oh no, wait a minute, my neighbor might not like the sound smell side of it, and, and so they get nailed by that. So on page four, line four, you'll see there's a definition of agricultural activities mm -hmm. that is part of the activities that are protected by the right to farm. Fortunately, you don't see the full definition here, but when you go to 60 SA 4802, you will see that it includes the ability to, to modify your farm, to innovate, etc. cetera. So that, that innovative activity is already protected. Okay, thank you. I like it. Yeah. Um, the uh, so um, are there other changes that that anyone would like to ask Michael to consider or think about uh, changing at this point? Uh, what we'll do is we'll if there are. I mean, you don't have to think about. It right this minute, but I'd like to, um, if there are going to be more, some more changes, um, to get this as, as good as we can get it as a committee to have it for Friday for the uh, participants in yeah. that hearing to be able to look at uh, and talk about and, and um, but we may mask them Friday during the hearing. Um, you know, they're because they're gonna have some comments, I'm sure, on on because they live it. Uh, you know, Richie's the closest thing we've got to a farmer in here. And, that isn't much, and, and that isn't much. <laughs> uh, but um, so, Brian, what do you think? You got more. Yeah, I'll, I'll look, I'm happy to look it over, Mr. Chair. I guess the the one thing is that just the generally accepted agricultural practices. It seems like a definition would be needed there, some greater understanding 
I don't know, as, are there other statutes that we use that in other policy that say generally? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. it's that's just the terminology that's being used. You can yeah, define it. Actually, the, using the, the term, AI. you could get rid of generally. You could just say, you know, custom agricultural practices or or, or come up with a definition. Well, there is. Yeah. There it is, is on page four. four. Is. On page sorry, four, it's right, okay, yeah. right. And it's it, I understand generally acceptable. Yeah. yeah. I understand that. Pretty broad. But, yeah. But it's that's really just. You you could call it law, right? You know, right? right. And, you know, and, and it's really just the term that's been used. Yes. Thanks. So, there was a word "reasonable" that was in play that I got an email about. I thought, but that has been changed, I guess, to uh, generally accepted. I'm just trying to remember. I don't even um, remember. Am I do you recall where that was? Um, on the new draft, I believe it's on page three, line five. Reasonable. Oh. But I'm not sure if that reasonable definition fixes well, that. Well, that's in statute now, I guess. Page three, line five? Yeah. Yeah. First word. The first word is reasonable. First, first word of mine is agricultural activity. Oh, okay. Oh, let's move up um, a little. Is that funny? All right, Rick. Let's get this in. Okay, oh, left. sure, got it. Um, well, honestly, oh, if you're, if you're going to use the generally accepted agricultural practices, those are reasonable agricultural activities um, because that's the standard in the state. Okay. I mean, but but that purpose section that hasn't changed. I mean, that's been right. there since oh, okay. oh. 2003, maybe even before oh, so that. That's existing language. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, Would it make sense to change that to generally accepted? Uh, I or, think. I mean, there's a possibility. I, I, you might want to use some of the, you might want to say instead of reasonable agricultural activities. You've just moved a little bit. We're not making a value judgment yet. Right? It's just a summary. That's definitely a possibility as well. Um, you could say something like the, the customs and standards for agricultural activities follow in the state instead of reasonable agricultural activities. Uh, I think you have options there. But again, that language has been it's there been since there. 2003, at least. Okay. Yeah, and that, I don't think anybody asked us to remove that. They highlighted that as a maybe we ought to look at and right. figure out if it should be there or not. And. Uh, and it's also a purpose section. Yeah. Right. Most purpose sections are not binding, they're just instructive to yeah. a court. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other suggestive changes? That's good. No? Um, well, um, I guess if you want to fool with that language on the page, Right, to so get them over further. Eliminate the municipalities and the region. I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and make it uh, more solid. Yeah, right. that would be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when, are you going to be able to be with us on Friday? I Friday have to Jordan? participate remotely. Just okay. FYI for the committee, my son's having surgery on his ears tomorrow. Oh. So, um, mm -hmm. I don't know how significant. Yeah. Significant, it's going to be so. Ear. Yeah, it's it's a it's not cancer, but it's a growth on both of his ears, and they don't know why it's there, but there's something that they identified inside that they have to cut out. Yeah. Well, 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 well that's the place yeah. you need to be. Yeah. 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 I mean, if. If you're free on Friday to be on Zoom, that's well, fine. I, I, I think I'll be fine. I, you know, 
They don't think the procedure is going to be that significant, but I just want to. Well, that's where you should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, no. yeah, that's why they're. Yeah. They, they can't understand. Like, they thought it was an ingrown hair, but then, like, yeah, why he, would you have. Yeah, put you off. Know. That's no big deal. No, but it doesn't affect his hearing, though. No, they, it can, uh, ultimately, if they don't get rid of it. Okay. Yeah. How, how old a boy is he? 15. Yeah. Well, he's going to be 15 in three weeks. Pretty soon. He's going to be 15. Well, that'd be good to get that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, good luck. They, uh, well, um, if there are no other questions, is there anything else, Michael, that we need done? Um, no, I think I'm in. Am I in this week on the miscellaneous bill? Thursday on the miscellaneous bill. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, see, to, for the committee, uh, before town meeting, I'd like to get that bill out of here. And if we can uh, get this one, done so everyone feels comfortable with it, uh, this one, mm -hmm. before town meeting, and, and then the house would have plenty of time uh, in the second half to do whatever they've got to do, and they'll send us uh, some of their stuff, so. Would we move the right to farm bill to judiciary on the floor, or? Well, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, and then Sears can look at it. Hopefully, he'll move that. Uh, okay. The, uh, I'd like to get it in a position where he's comfortable. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's possible with it. Yeah. I, I think you've made good, great changes. Yeah. Yeah. Senator so, Sheriff, do you know when? So, crossover, is it the 17th? We don't have one, I don't think. <laughs> no, we do it. No crossover date. Oh, I thought we did have the 17th. I, yeah, maybe. I thought it was, because yeah. I remember hearing it was really yeah, yeah. late. It's, it's, in the, it's in the calendar. It is a little late this year. I don't ever yes. worry yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. I don't even think about it. Yeah. Uh, it's probably a compliment for both of us. I bet it is. I'm, I'm the other lucky. I'm not. What did I win? Is yeah. this a raffle? Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Well, yeah. at least it's from my district. Right, right. <laughs> it's after the town meeting break, I think. It is. It's yeah. like, yeah. But it's in the count. It's in, it's it's in the count. I remember thinking, wow. Yeah. Let me look it up. Yes, yeah, But it would be good to get those two gone. Either the Sears or yeah. and uh, the housekeeping bill. I, have you gone through that, Michael? Uh, With you? Yeah, yep. we've been through it, mm -hmm. but we didn't. We need to work on that. Make sure that it's wh where we want it to be before we vote it. But we got a couple more weeks anyway, so um, we'll go through that a little closer and uh, make sure that we feel comfortable uh, with what they are proposing. Yep, it is yep. March 17th. Back in Mission Day. Also, that's a... Also St. Patrick's Day. That's a week at, a couple of weeks. We go on the 7th or something, right? That week of the 7th. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So it'd be the week we come back, would be cross over yeah. in it. It's not good to get caught up in that yeah. chunk either. You yeah, want to get so. it done either before or do what I do, do it the week after and, or two after and go get yeah. it. Because I'm supposed to speak at the Troy Town meeting, I think, on that Tuesday. They just want an update on things generally. They're coming. He's the featured are you still speaker. The moderator. I got an email about uh, that. You're the featured speaker, you, right? Yeah, right, right. Huh? Are you imagining him? Yeah. <laughs> he's a, he's the moderator. Yeah, are you the moderator? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, he you just probably would not get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> you could ever see it. <laughs> How long have you been the moderator oh there? Since I was 21. Really? <laughs> That's great. Jesus, uh, that's a yeah. long time ago, wasn't it? Well, a few years. So, um, great. Thank yeah, you. Anything else for nope. Michael? No. Well, good. thank you, Michael. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Good, luck. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, good luck for good sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know. We'll, uh, I haven't seen him in five years since before COVID. Are we off? No. Oh. Ready to go off? Um, yeah.